Thank you. Look forward to this. Um, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. It's a real honor to be able to do this and talk about my experience. Um, I went a little bit, I, I, I really ended up skipping over a lot of things. Um, one, of the, one of the things that went very well the last period, people ask questions. It really works well. If I say something and you've got a question about it, just, call, just raise your hand. We'll, take, we'll answer questions as we go through it, and we'll have time at the end. Yes, sir? Where's Bobby? Bobby's in Pensacola. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. So. Um, so bear with me as I go through my, I've got so much information. Um, I'm getting older and uh, memory's not so good, so I'm going to be looking at notes a lot. But um, um, I'm going to give you a lot of anecdotal information that I'm, you can draw from, from what I tell you as to what lessons are to be learned. I'm going to try and emphasize things that I think are important. Um, and one of the things I want to start with, what qualifies me to call myself a leader? I have, um, I've got medals and letters of commendation. I've got a pension from the FBI, which means I made it. My pension is a combination of the Army and the FBI together, 30 years. I've earned a pension as a teacher. I'm still working. But I know absolute total failures who I think people were lousy, officers, lousy leaders that have the same qualifications I do. So what is it, I think, what is it that makes that I feel competent to stand up here? One thing, I can look myself in the mirror. When it comes to my leadership, what I did as a leader, I have no regrets. I, I can look myself in the mirror and I think that is, at the end of the day, what's most important. The um, it really, um, I have to say that because there's a lot of people, you're probably wondering, uh, it's like all these qualities of leadership, well, how do we have so many bad leaders? And, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say to that other than you want to be able to look yourself in the mirror and be proud of what you did. My wife was here, um, and I think she's coming back. Um, that's, in my leadership capacity, I can look myself in the mirror. Um, Sometimes in my personal life, I can't, I have a hard time. I've, I've done some bad things, people that love me, and I, uh, uh, I but, but that makes, it reinforces to me even more uh, how proud I am of my leadership because I, I when I led people, I, I always put them first, and that's, that's a key to, to uh, I think, leadership. What is leadership? I made a definition, and I'm going to see if I can, I, tr I tried to, I, I came up with my own definition, and uh, this is, uh, it's, if somebody else has come up with it, I didn't plagiarize it, because I honestly came up with this on my own. What is leadership to me? And I think it's the ethical management of people and assets with, and the leader has to be willing to take logical risks and you have to be willing to sacrifice yourself, your career. That's what Billy Mitchell did, for those of you that, Air Force, that's, you know, he did. He did the right thing. He's a hero right now. He, he sacrificed himself. Um, that's the difference between a leader and a manager. And one of the, in the FBI, there's a lot of things that would take a long time. I hope I can explain. In the FBI, I was a career case agent. I was an investigator. Um, and we make life and death, death decisions. We're the ones that solve cases and say, he's in that room, we've got to go in and get him. And people could die. Um, FBI management is, they're managers. They're shuffling papers and making sure the books are, are right. So um, the experience I had in the military is, uh, direct leadership, where you're in, in charge of troops, and the, uh, in the FBI it was more indirect, where again, you're, you're working on cases, and uh, the people that you're giving orders to don't take orders from you all the time. It's during certain times, when uh, arrest situations and things like that. Um, so, disruption. That's all I know. Uh, when I first got this topic, I thought, 
what else is there? I, every period that I've, uh, for f over 40 years, every period that I've um, uh, s functioned as a leader, it's been a disruptive period. So this is not going to be anything. Uh, this, this is what you should expect. I'll give you a little bit of a rundown of uh, the time. I started in 79 as an Army officer, and I'm still teaching right now. So we'll talk about some of the disruptive periods. Uh, the first one, I was in 79, I was at the end of the Vietnam War. And that was disruptive in many ways. Uh, number one, our strategic mission had changed. The focus was no longer Southeast Asia. The focus was in Europe where they thought World War III was going to start any day. The Fulda Gap. Uh, the Fulda Gap is in Germany where we thought the Russians and the East Germans were going to come pouring through any day. And so that mission changed. We had a huge reduction in force after Vietnam. And it was pretty ugly. The captains and about the field officers, people were fighting to keep their careers. And I think there was a lot, it was very disruptive because nobody really knew what to expect in, in the, uh, uh, as far as what was going to happen with the Russians. There was always conflicting intelligence. and um, the, There were a lot of people that actually died because of what I think bad leadership because people wanted to keep their, the officers wanted to keep their careers so bad that they would never say no. There were a lot of yes men. Um, Captain, can you can you do six Lance missile uh, fire missions in uh, 24 hours? Yes, sir, my men can do anything. Well, a lot of times it was way beyond. Some, they should have spoke up and said, that's insane, sir. Um, and people were driven. We had, I lost about eight troops, training accidents, um, killed because um, of what we, were, what we were doing. I once went, I'll never forget this. I w once went from Wednesday morning we had been in the field for a while. I went from Wednesday morning, uh, about, got up about 5 or 6 in the morning, sleeping on the ground, get up. And I went from Wednesday morning till Saturday evening without eating or sleeping. And that wasn't ranger training or any special. That was just because we had officers that wouldn't say, hey, give these guys a break. That's just the way it was. That was the atmosphere we were in. Um, the FBI, uh, I was in from 82 to 2008. I wasn't an agent at first. It took me a few years to become an agent. Now, the first one I'm going to, I, I'm probably going to get some comments. Um, first major disruption, transition, I was in the, from the J. Edgar Hoover FBI to the modern FBI. Does anybody not know who J. Edgar Hoover was? How many of you don't know? Oh, yeah, because I don't, okay. He was, a, he was the director of the FBI from like 19, I should know this, 28 or somewhere, all the way to 72. He is the father of the FBI. He made it, the re, he gave it the reputation that it has. Right now, he's demonized. Uh, as a total tyrant, evil person. But I'm a member of the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI, and I will tell you, everybody that served under him adores him. And, and I know from the people that I work for that uh, I, I also am a fan and every retired agent that's a member of our association. This is one of our missions, is to promote and to maintain his legacy. He did, he did some bad things. He was there, maybe, maybe the only thing you could really fault him for, he was there too long. He stayed, he, he died in office. Um, but the one thing about him, why we adore him as a leader, he was very demanding, and he fired a lot of people. He had very high expectations. Integrity was one of them. And if you, um, 
didn't meet his expectation, he'd fire you. But what he did, the reason he's so adored, is if you did what he asked you to do, he would stand behind you to the end of the earth. And he wouldn't let anybody touch you. And if you did what he wanted you to do, and this is a good leader, he stood behind you. And um, this, is, this, is one, this is his legacy. He also, he, he, again, he demanded, we lived under an honor code like the FBI honor code, uh, FBI agents. And you've seen in the news recently, has that changed a little bit maybe? Um, but but it, was, um, uh, it was a very, um, he, was, he, he, he ran a good outfit. Now, you may be saying, wait a second, you came in in 82, he died in 72. How can you say you're part of the Hoover FBI? Well, because everybody at the mid and upper level, everybody, the, my bosses when I started were all Hoover people. And they all ran the bureau like, like the Hoover Bureau. Um, <clears throat> the second major disruption uh, was the end of the Cold War, which happened in 1989, 1990 fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, huge disruption on, on the personal side. My family's from East Germany. And my grandfather was the only one that came here for, uh, he came here before World War II, but all of his family was in East Germany. And I grew up, more than most Americans, we were just devastated because our family hometown was sacred this old medieval city in the middle of uh, Saxon-Anhalt. And my dad was always lamenting. We'd never know our relatives. They were on the other side of the wall. And we thought that that was going to go on until the end of time. We never thought the Soviet Union was going to fall. And when it fell, I mean, it was in incredible. And not only uh, for me on a personal note, but also because I work counterintelligence. And our whole mission changed overnight. People that had been our dread enemies were now our allies. It was, the whole transition was just, it, it, what, what the, the, everything we've talked about this morning, it was pronounced. Um, then we had 9-11, and that changed everything. Now, I am not too fond of our leadership at that time, and I had some comments, and please feel free to comment, but one of the things, the FBI's taken a lot of heat, a lot of blame for 9-11. The FBI failed us. We did, we made some mistakes that might have actually led to a better outcome. But our mission, what is the mission of the FBI? To investigate something that happened and put people in jail. And our leaders just mea culpa, mea culpa, so sorry, and they, they really hurt the morale of the people in the FBI because they didn't stand up for us. The FBI overall was doing its job. Um, another situation where th there was a uh, Department of Justice had actually forbidden us from sharing information with the intelligence community. So a lot of the information uh, that might have maybe led to uh, a better outcome, we couldn't give to intelligence agents. Does anybody know why that happens? Why won't they let the FBI share? Because uh, CIA doesn't have a mandate to operate within the United States for like domestic security. Okay, now that's good. You're, you're right. You're, you're close. Vision and authority. Yes, and, w and yeah, okay. Be more specific. Yeah, that's it. That's the answer. Yes, sir, exactly. And with that is our, what we do is put, try and put people in jail. And the CIA is not putting people in jail. They're, they're working on intelligence for military and for strategic use. So because of our Constitution, if 
if we gave information to the CIA and then we charge somebody with a crime, they have a right to have that evidence made public. And so we, we don't, um, we don't um, give information unless we know for a fact it's not going to become, uh, it's not going to go to court. Now, I disagree at the time, and I still disagree, the Department of Justice, in my opinion, is too intransigent on the way they, uh, the, the way that when they gave that order that we weren't allowed to share because there should be, and, and what, what, I did, um, what, what I did in my capacity when I was overseas as liaison with the German police, if someone can be fairly assured it's not going to go to court, then you should be able, we should give that to the intelligence community. And I had a situation when I was in uh, Germany where a, uh, a young American, young woman had a boyfriend who was German, he was Turkish, and he threatened to blow up the military base at Heidelberg. And so he was arrested by the Germans and our whole headquarters was like, oh, there's, here's a new terrorist case. Well, it turned out there was nothing to it. He was one of these, like, like a lot of my high school class, uh, trying to think of how to describe him, sort of a derelict who just liked to blow things up. And he had a big mouth. And he said, I hate America. I, and, and there were really, there was nothing to it. He, he ended up getting about a year in jail for uh, explosive charges and it was mostly homemade gunpowder blowing up mailboxes and things like that. So the military asked me if they could, if I'd give them a report because he's still a threat. He's not, he's not Al-Qaeda, he's not any strategic major threat, he's just a bad guy that they need to know about. And I gave them the information and someone in my headquarters was furious because they said, that was a bad move because now we can't prosecute him. And I said, you know what, there's not a chance. Nobody in the United States was going to prosecute this guy. I ended up, I, I, I took a little bit of heat, but I ended up, um, it was okay. Um, but so that, that's anyway, I got a little bit off track, but that's one of the problems with 9-11. Um, again, when our leadership failed to speak up on our behalf, so now our mission has changed and that's okay. So now we've got a new mission, fine. But it hurt a lot of people, it, it, it hurt morale, but they didn't stand up for us. And this is part of being a leader. Um, you have to fully know and understand every aspect of what you're doing. And, and, and we had a lot of politicians that were just more interested in um, promoting themselves than doing what was right. And, and this is, a lot of this, as I, as I told the previous group, a lot of what I'm gonna tell you and you're going to say, this is common sense. This is no-brainer. And yes, exactly. But I will tell you, common sense is not that common. From what I've seen in the last 40-some years, I'm, I'm appalled at the number of bad leaders that are out there. So if I'm repeating things that sound simple, just do me a favor and trust me and just, do, just pay attention to it because, it, like I said, it's not that common. Um, so then after, after, uh, after the FBI, I was an analyst, um, a contract analyst. Not a lot of leadership involved in analytical job, although we did have um, disruption because analysts had produced faulty information which led to the Iraq war in 2003. Well, a lot of, a lot of uh, not to say that that would, uh, the Iraq war would have probably happened, but, but there was, a lot of emphasis that uh, was based on inaccurate information. And the reason was analysts, were, w analysts wanted to give the boss what he wanted to hear. Uh, President Bush and some of the, uh, the vi Vice President Cheney, a lot of these people wanted, the analysts knew that they, that they were anxious to uh, go into Iraq and so they were producing inaccurate reporting because they were they were stretching things to try and make, make themselves look good because it's, it's good to tell the boss what he wants to hear. It's 
bad to tell the emperor he has no clothes. So, <clears throat> and then right now I'm um, currently a teacher, and teaching has put everything together for me. It's really, um, it, it's, uh, it's different, it's disruptive, because it's different from when I went to school. So I have to relearn. When I started teaching, I, what I had as a, role, as a model in my mind was the way the school was when I went through, and it's totally different. So it's disruptive. Everything, every stage of my career has been, and, and as a leader, I've been in disruptive times. Before I move on, any questions so far on uh, the disruptions and some of the history? Um, let me talk about um, when I was in the Army, and I'm going to give you one of my, I only have like two major em points of emphasis. And um, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you, but this is the way it really was. When they had the drawdown at, at the end of Vietnam, they had a lot of officers in the Army had been prior enlisted. And they either got battlefield promotions or they went to OCS and were officers combat, in combat in Vietnam, captains, company commanders, battery commanders. And when they drew down at the end of Vietnam, they gave the option they said to these, to these men, if you want to stay to get your pension, you have to go back to being enlisted. And you finish your time, your 20 years, and when you finish your 20 years, you will, will give you a major's pension. So imagine being a 22-year-old fresh-faced lieutenant from BMI giving orders to a man who had been a captain a company commander in combat in Vietnam. Can you spell awkward? Can you imagine? And now, this is one of the big, big uh, lessons: is you have to, you have to empathize, empathize with your troop. You have to. Um, can you imagine how painful that must have been? I, imagine yourself being a captain in combat. And now you're taking orders from somebody that was in junior high school when you, when you were doing that. Um, so you have to be cognizant of that. You have to be empathetic. But you can't also bend over and just say, I'm so sorry. I, I, this isn't right. I'm so sorry I'm giving, you know, you, you tell me what to do. I, I feel so bad. No, you can't do that. You got to do your job. But you just have to empathize. And you have to... You just have to treat them a little bit better. Don't, you know, I'm ordering you. No, you don't talk to them like that. It's like, uh, hey, Sergeant, look, I really need you to do this. Uh, I, you know, that you, you just have to change your tone a little bit, okay? Um, what else uh, in the Army? Um, So I think, um, oh, here's the most important lesson of everything. You, you've all been told, especially you that are going Army or Marines, you've been told you have to, a good NCO will make you or break you. Cliche, but it's 100% on, on topic. Um, you have to know who's good and who's bad. You have to know your job well enough to know who's doing their job. But when you find a good NCO, um, mine was Sergeant First Class Bobby Henson, and I owe that guy everything. And uh, I, I learned how to let him teach me, and that is critical. And the one most important lesson that um, he taught me was, it, again, it was, it was an ugly time. It was a disruptive time. I've heard yelling and screaming and swearing like I've never heard in my life. People were really on edge because a lot of these captains, majors, lieutenant colonels, they wanted to make a career and they were worried 
one mistake and you were gone. And I saw a lot of bad leadership. I didn't mention this last, I forgot to mention this in the last period, but I actually got, I, was, I commanded an artillery battery as a second lieutenant. And one of two ways, see if you can guess which one. Either I was that good, or my battery commander, real hot temper, was intoxicated and punched a second lieutenant in the nose with the battalion commander standing right behind him. Which one do you think it is? Option two. That's how bad things were. And Bobby Hinson, I'll never forget, he said to me, because I started to get that way. I was just mimicking what I was seeing above me, and I, I started yelling and screaming. And He called me and he said, Lieutenant, I know the bad influence these jokers, he called them jokers, are having on you, but you've got to understand something. And I'm pretty sure I've got this quote down pat. He said, you've got to be the coolest cat in the joint. You've got to have ice water in your veins. You cannot be yelling and screaming and jumping up and down. And that has stayed with me for the rest of my life. Now, unfortunately, my wife, Nancy, in the back there, my shortcoming is, uh, I don't think I've always done that in my personal life, but I did do that after Bobby Hinson taught me that. And, and whenever I'm in a leadership capacity, no matter what is going on, you've got to stay calm. Simple advice, that's, that's my most important thing to tell you. You just have to stay calm. And you're going to see people going to pieces all around you. You can't do it. Um, <clears throat> Now let's go to the FBI. Um, any questions? Yes? How do you manage to stay calm, sir? It's a weird, you know, I just, I think of Bobby Hinson. Whenever something's going bad and I'm tempted to just lose it, I think of Bobby Hinson. I think of him telling me that. You've got to be the coolest cat in the joint. You've got to have ice water flowing through your veins. And... That's, that, I, that's, I just, it just comes to me. When things are really melting down, I just think of him. And uh, very important. Um, when I was in the FBI, um, I actually had one other thing that happened. And we actually had a JAG officer in here, and I, I, I was feeling the heat a little bit with my comment, but... Um, uh, especially for the VMI and, and the military school with the honor system, and a lot of the civilian schools have honor systems. Um, the honor system, I think I'm more into the honor system now, even than when I was a cadet. I, it's honor, lie, cheating, stealing, tolerating those that do. It's, 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 it's what I live by. And the problem is you're going to get into situations out there where it's not going to be quite as clear cut as it is here. And the one that I mentioned that uh, um, I had a situation in the Army when I went in. We were artillery, and what they really cared about was how well we knew our artillery job. The one day they said, we have to qualify everybody on the M16. And they just sent us out. They weren't, we didn't have a chance to zero. We just went out and uh, started shooting at the targets. And the commanding officer said, everyone will qualify as an expert. So I knew in my heart that I missed a lot of targets. When I went in and saw the qualification, they had me down as 90. And I said, I, now, the, uh, the, w the, what happened was I, I, because of the VMI honor system, I went and reported. And I said, sir, this is inaccurate. And I, got a whole, I got myself in trouble. I got other people in trouble. And... Um, I told the crowd I did the wrong thing. Well, the JAG officer that was here said, no, that's, you know, today he'd get relieved, you'd get relieved. So I, I you know, I didn't really, nobody was keeping, nobody was actually counting the hits. I just knew in my heart. What, what it was was a familiarization. And he was putting us all down as experts. So I guess that was a false official statement. But at the time, um, I couldn't really say for sure that I didn't do a 90 because I wasn't, nobody was actually marking it down. I just knew, I knew in my heart that I wasn't hitting the targets like I should have. And um, 
there are going to be times when you have to make decisions in a situation like that. It, it, that, that was my example from 40 years ago. But there will be times when it's not quite clear. Um, it's not like when you're here, if, you know, you're either in an all right place or you're not. And you know, you know that if you've, you know, you've got 48 hours to bone yourself, if you're, which means put yourself on report, if you're not in an all right place. Sometimes it's not that clear, but deep down inside, you're, um, you have to, situation by situation, you have to really analyze uh, what's going on. I'll, I'll give you another, I'll give you two examples from the FBI. We had a, we had a, uh, a policy involving what we call backstopping. <clears throat> and backstopping means, I'll give you an example. I was in an undercover capacity and I was flying overseas. And the, I was on, I have high blood pressure medicine. I've been on it for a long time. And I noticed I have a fake ID, I have a fake passport, fake driver's license, different name, I'm undercover. But my, the medicine I was taking with me had my real name on the bottle. So I knew I had to do something. So I went to DEA, went to a VMI grad who I knew who worked for DEA, and they got me a bottle, prescription bottle with my fake name on it. Now, we have memorandums of understanding that whenever that happens, there has to be, it has to be, go through a chain of command. It has to be approved at different levels. And I had a situation where I was in charge in uh, Germany, and um, one of our sister agencies needed backstopping, and I knew that I didn't have time to get it fully staffed. And I knew that if, I, if they didn't get my backstopping, their mission was going to fail. So I went ahead without authorization and approved it. Now, that wasn't really lying, cheating, or stealing. I didn't do it for self-gain. I did it for the oath that I took that I knew that the mission was going to fail. And the mission was more important than me. So I, I, took, I took a risk to, um, uh, to, to, to go ahead, and I would have gotten in trouble. I, I doubt I'd have been fired, but I would have gotten in trouble if th something would have gone wrong, but I made that decision. You'll be confronted with things like that, and you should be acting by the oath of office you took and not for your own personal self-gain. There was another time in the FBI where I was, um, I was with a huge, we had seized a lot of evidence, and every agent had to write a report about the evidence that they had seized. And this was way back, we didn't have word processors, this is ancient times. We actually gave dictation to a typist who typed up our reports for us. And one of the reports came back and it had my name on the wrong evidence. The typist had mixed up the notes, and she had my name on the report, that evidence that I didn't take. I said, I can't sign this, because I may have to testify in court. And if I have to, I'll take an oath that I'm telling the truth, and I'm not about to. And I actually had a superior order me to sign it. And I refused. And there was a clear cut. You know, some of the times these things are a little fuzzy, like the M16 qualify. Sometimes it's like, eh, is this really worth dying for? But uh, this time it was. It was clear cut. There was no doubt in my mind that if I signed that, I was lying under oath. And that I'd have to go in court and lie under oath, and I wouldn't do it. And I thought I might get fired because this guy was higher ranking and he was furious. And he didn't, for the rest of the time I was in Washington, he didn't like me, I don't really care. But I didn't get fired and luckily, luckily things worked out. So that's trying, I'm trying to give you an, an idea for how things are gonna be. You know, here, um, our honor code, cadet will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those that do. Um, Tolerating those that do is a little bit harder out there. 
because sometimes you're not in a position that you can really do anything about it. Sometimes the people who are lying, cheating, and stealing are over you. And that's a tough one to juggle. You have to do your best. Um, another thing on risk, um, risking, I don't, like I said, I'm getting old. I did, did I tell you the story about White Sands, New Mexico? Okay. Another story on risk. Um, I was in a situation, White Sands, New Mexico is one of the worst places on earth. For all the army people, people say Fort Polk. White Sands is probably a close second. White Sands is in the middle of the desert. And we were there, I, I was in a Lance Missile uh, Battalion and um, we did desert training there and it was the only place we could fire in the United States because our missiles went 80 miles. And it was desolate and it was, it, it sort of got on you after a while. We were there for weeks at a time. And I had, um, we had a situation where some officers, well, I was with a group of officers. We were coming back from somewhere. This was in our off time. It was like a Saturday night and we had a rare, we were back in our little Quonset huts out in the middle of the desert. And they had, White Sands had, um, didn't have much, but it had like a bowling alley with uh, a bar. And a group of officers, we were walking, some of our enlisted came out and said, sirs, we got a problem. We got a bunch of thugs in there trying to pick a fight with us. And it's gonna be ugly. We got, our entire battery is in there. And I, it, it's gonna be ugly. And um, most of the officers that, that I was with just pretended like they didn't hear it and just sort of walked away. And, I've, and I, I, I'm sort of uncomfortable, I'm bragging here, but this is one of my proudest moments. Um, we had good troops. Uh, a lot of the Army, when I was there, when I started, were given a choice of going to jail or going in the Army. We had a lot in, in the regular tube artillery, we had a lot of bad apples. But my Lance troops all had top secret clearance because we had nuclear warheads. And they were, they, were, they were good guys. And I knew that th these guys sincerely came to us um, with, this, with this problem and I just, I, I couldn't walk away from it. Now, this is where you have to risk. Because, and, and luckily for me, again, logical risk. My best friend was a guy named Chris Constance who was a second, uh, we were both second lieutenants. He was a bodybuilder and he was massive. And he also played violin in the Oklahoma City Symphony. I mean, this guy was a this guy was an unbelievable human being. But anyway, I looked at Chris, and I said, "Chris, let's 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 go." And he said, "Yeah, let's do it." So we walked in. Now, by doing this, we were exposing. We could have been, I could have been beat up. I could have gotten in trouble, career-wise. But this, to me, is the best example of leadership. This is. This is where it's not about you. It's about the oath you took. It's about not your men, your, your, your soldiers. Um, sorry, I keep saying men, and I, I, I'm back at the time when it was an all-male. But anyway, it, it was, um, I felt that I had to go in there. And luckily, it worked out. I uh, walked in, there were a bunch of, bunch of these thugs and they bought us milk. It was like trying to pick a fight, you know. You're not men enough to have alcohol, we're gonna buy you milk. And I took the milk and I said, oh wow, I've been wanting this for so long, thank you. And I drank it, just a lot of silly banter back. And they finally said, do you wanna fight or not? And I said, no, we don't wanna fight. And that ended it. And uh, so that was my proudest moment. That to me was leadership. Um, uh, ironically, I went back and reported it to the battalion commander and he, had somebody do an investigation. They were all off-duty MPs. So I hope, is anybody going military police here? <laughs> that, um, anyway, any questions? Um, <clears throat> let me consult my notes here. I still got a ways to go, but I wanna make sure. Any, no questions so far? Okay. Um,
So now going into the FBI again, and um, I really have two messages. One is to stay calm, and the other is to know your job. And this was more apparent in the FBI. Um, two different types of leadership. The Army, uh, I think I've mentioned, is direct leadership, where you've got people under your command all the time, and you're leading them. The FBI is more indirect leadership, and which translates more to corporate, I think, corporate America, too. So those of you that are going private sector. Um, the, a lot of, I've seen a lot of people ruined by what we call the Peter Principle. Has anybody ever heard of that? You have? Yeah, you promote people to their highest level of incompetence. Uh, thank you. Perfect. You will rise to your highest level of incompetence. And in the private sector and the FBI, this is um, the undoing of a lot of people because they want to get promoted. Stay in, if you're in that situation, stay in your job till you're an expert. And don't move up until it's time. In the Army, in the military, unfortunately, you've got to, it's a different, you've got to, if you're a first lieutenant, you've got to make captain in a certain amount of time. If you're a captain, you've got to make major. So, you, but, but still, to the best of your ability, know your job. Uh, we have one of, the, one of the truest little sayings that I've, that, that, that I've heard and experienced is A's hire A's and B's hire C's. Does anybody know what that means? Bob, you know? <laughs> I think you know. How about you guys? A's hire A's, what does that mean? Exactly. Thank you. Right on the money. And I've seen it. It's so true. It's scary. So if you're an A, means you're a very competent person. You're competent in your, in your content knowledge, your leadership ability. You're motivated by wanting to, by the mission. You want to be the best you can be, and you want the mission to succeed. You're going to bring people in that are better than you are. You're going to try and get, you're not, you're not intimidated because um, you might be a full colonel and they might be a full colonel on their way to becoming a general, but you should be satisfied that if that person is better than you and you bring them in, they become a general, um, you're, still con you're still satisfied. You're a very competent full board colonel and you should be happy and accept that. You want to do the mission and you want, that's your number one goal. You take pride in how successful your mission is, you bring in the best people. A lot of people that just want, they, they just want the status. And the FBI, I want to be an assistant special agent in charge. I want to be a special agent in charge. I want the money. I want to live in Washington. And they're, they're not competent. What do they do? They bring in people worse than them because that'll make them look good. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Because the B's are the middle managers in the corporate world who have the most to lose if there's a big disruption. They're on the track and they don't want to get off the track. Interesting. Interesting. And I think now that you mention that, I think I have seen that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, that was very good. Um, we had a saying in the FBI that. Um, and unfortunately, we have a lot of people, and it shouldn't be a surprise, you've, you've probably seen the news recently, some of the, some of the problems the FBI's been having. But we used to have a saying, um, now, you have to know the term is special agent in charge, we call it SAC. We used to have a saying, I can understand how we became an SAC, but I can't understand how we ever got in the FBI. So, um, that is, uh, that is uh, again, those are the two big themes I have, um, is that you, you have to remain calm, you have to stay under control, 
And you, you have to do your best to know your job. If you really know your job, you're confident in what you're doing. If you put those two things together, that's 90% of it. Uh, <clears throat> A couple other little things. Um, you may have to work harder than you can imagine to get where you, where you want to get. And don't rely on the organization to teach you everything you need to know. What, the best thing that ever happened to me, and when I started off it seemed like an impossible task, but I wanted to go to Germany. I wanted to be stationed in Germany. And my German, I had studied German at VMI and done very well, but then I'd gone 20 years without speaking it. And I decided that I really wanted to pursue this, so I got the FBI to pay for language training. And, but I still had to do my full job, which was about 60 to 80 hours a week. So I was really putting in the hours. But and, and nobody was really guiding me on this, but I, I, this is, I, had a, I had a goal of what I wanted to do in the organization. And I did what I had to do. And you're not going to always have people guiding you, telling you exactly um, what you need to know to be the most effective leader or, 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 or whatever, whatever your goal is. You, you're going to have to figure that out on your own. You're going to have to be a self-starter, and you're going to have to... Um, uh, Pursue, pursue your goals with, with your own, on your own initiative. So your initiative is very important. The last, um, I'm not going to really talk about my analytical, my job as an analyst, because that wasn't really leadership. I, I talked about some of the issues as far as um, accurate reporting, you know, where, where, the, where the honor system comes in. Sometimes the truth isn't what the boss wants to hear. So you have to just do your job and not, w there were a lot of analysts that got in a lot of trouble after, uh, after the Iraq war because they went back and looked at their reporting and some of it was circular reporting. Uh, are you familiar with that term? Circular reporting is sort of, um, how would I describe it? Yeah, it's yeah, and it's worst and it's worst. Uh, the worst example would be if um, I tell somebody a rumor, and then the rumor gets around, and I take that rumor because I've heard it now. I've heard it from somebody else. It didn't come from me, ostensibly, and I take that and make a report, and I turn that in because I w that's what I want somebody to hear. That's circular reporting. That, th things like this actually happen, and. Um, Again, you guys are not looking, I don't think anybody, uh, if you're ever in an analytical position, but you will also, you'll be confronted with this in leadership capacity where, where people are tempted to write reports that people want to hear. Um, the last um, phase of my leadership experience was actually, is right now, it's probably most difficult, and that is teaching. And... This goes back to what Bobby Hinson told me, Sergeant Bobby Hinson, and um, it goes back to you got to be the coolest cat in the joint. You got to have ice water in your veins. And if there's any way any of you can teach early on in your career, it's the ultimate because when you walk into a classroom, you could have just had the worst day of your life. You could have had your lost your best friend, you totaled your car. A meteor landed in your house the night before. All these horrible things. You've got to stand up in front of that class and you've got to be just 100% spot on. Because it's not their fault and it's not their problem about the problems you're having. And you have to teach the class. And that, that is, um, again, I thought of Bobby Hinson when I started teaching seven years ago. I, I had... Over the last seven years, I've had a lot of bad things happen. And when you go into that classroom, it doesn't matter. You've got to be on top of, you've got to be on top of your game, no matter what your situation is. So 
it reinforced that whole ice water in your veins and uh, uh, staying calm. So I think, um, I think that's pretty much, I've covered most of it. I want to open it up for some questions. And um, let me just make sure. I did have one other thing I wanted to talk about. Um, I skipped over. And um, that is being a genuine person. And there's a lot of superficial, there's a lot of people in leadership positions that you can tell their interest in their subordinates and in their superiors is very superficial. It's um, a good example would be I, I've known a lot of leaders that feel like they have to, they have to attend like a hail and farewell uh, or they have to attend some social function. But they'll show up and they'll be there for five minutes so everybody can see I'm here. And then as soon as the spotlight is off, they take off. You can tell their heart is not really there. Your people at all levels, your subordinates, your superiors, they have to believe you're sincere. And um, when I was in Germany, that was um, one of my jobs in liaison. I was embedded with the German police. And um, of course, this wasn't that tough because they were allowed to drink beer in the car. They were allowed to drink beer in the office. So um, I was uh, very sincere in enjoying being able to work with them. But um, you have to be. You know, when I was in, uh, we actually captured a, a fugitive who uh, they made a Discovery Channel documentary about it. And they actually, a Hollywood movie was based off of it, The Tourist with Johnny Depp. We captured a guy named Shalom Weiss in, um, long story, we captured him in Vienna, Austria. But the only reason it happened is because I was on good terms with the German police. They, I actually, a lot of them had to cancel their leave. They're not required to help us. They, we can ask them, and if they say no, there's nothing we can do about it. And I literally was, became like family with them. And so when I said, we've got this fugitive coming, and I just got a notification, it was at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and I found out he's coming, and if we don't, well, actually, we, had to, we followed his girlfriend from Brazil to Germany, and then she led us to him. He was really good at hiding out. And uh, we followed his girlfriend, and um, she, fl she arrived at like th 3 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. And I went to these guys at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday night, and they spun the whole thing up, and we ended up getting this guy. And it was because we had a relationship, a, a genuine relation. If I'd have just been sterile, um, official, I'm your liaison, um, Here's my business card. Have a nice, have a nice week. Never had anything to do. I, they probably wouldn't have helped me. So, to really get the best, uh, to be a good leader, you've got to be sincere. You've got to really develop relationships, and you've got to maintain those relationships. So that's it. Uh, we've got time for questions. Okay, um, it was everything I expected and more. Um, I was lucky, I got in, minimum requirement is a four year college degree and three years work experience. If you have a law degree or an accounting degree or speak a language like Arabic, or if you're a computer specialist, you can get right in. So it's, uh, it's um, well, actually, you get right. You just have to pass a background check and all that. But uh, it, it always it takes no matter who you are, it takes about a year to get processed. But uh, it took me five years because I just, um, in order to meet the threshold they were looking for, I had to score really high on the test. If you're if you have qualifications they really want, you don't have to score that high on the test. But I had to score real high, and it, I had three chances, and it wasn't my third and final chance. I finally got a high enough score to get interviewed, and everything went, went well. That's a good question. So uh, accounting, law, 
Arabic, uh, there, there's several languages. that They have a website. There's like Farsi, Arabic, Chinese, uh, Mandarin, um, or a computer specialist. And other, there's a few other technical specialists, but they have a website and it has what they're looking for. But if you don't have what they're looking for, you can still do it. It just takes a little bit longer. Uh, no, that's the nice thing about the FBI. You can move all over the place. You can. Um, I I started counterintelligence, and I got bored, so I went and became a bomb technician, and then back to counter. And then I went to Germany. And then back to, uh, uh, that's the one thing I like about the FBI. You know, if you're DEA, you're going to be doing drugs. That's it. Uh, Secret Service, you're going to be protecting, protection, and you're also going to be um, counterfeit and uh, credit card fraud. That's it. FBI's got like 400 violations that we work. So there's all kinds of different areas you can go. And, and the nice thing is the reality of the FBI, if you're doing a good job, and you tell your boss, you know, I've, I've been working bank robbery for eight years now. I really would like to work white collar crime. You'll get there. They'll make it happen. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, you need to reward people for doing that and make it public. So um, you, you, you can judge the product. And I've never been a supervisor. I, when I was an analyst, I was in just, you know, that's all I did. Is, uh, it was a contract job after I retired from the FBI. But had a, if I would have been a supervisor, I would have looked at the content and um, I would have, again, knowing, knowing your job, like, what, you know, this sounds a little bit too much like perfect. Are you sure? And, you know, and then when somebody does come up with a product that maybe goes against the grain, reward them and make it known. Like, here's the letter of commendation. He did a great job. She did a great job. Um, and it was not what we thought. The information was not what we thought. And they set us on the right track. That's how you do it. So um, you reward in public. You admonish in private. You heard that? So when somebody does something good, let everybody know. When somebody does something bad, pull them aside. Don't embarrass them and humiliate them unless you're in the infantry. <laughs> Other questions? I guess we're about, what time are we supposed to go? 3.45? It's 3.44. Nobody has a one minute question? Where was the best place you were stationed, sir? Frankfurt, Germany. Frankfurt, Germany, without a doubt. Yes? PTs, um, uh, at VMI, penalty tours. Uh, I have a lot of. I remember sitting. We, it was different than it is now. We we had to sit like in a detention study hall, and I just remember spending a lot of time down there. So uh, the exact numbers uh, a little fuzzy, but yes. Most heinous thing I did as a rat. Well, I um, I was painting on my dykes walls, little poems, <laughs> and I didn't think that figure out it was me. And uh, they got in trouble. They got inspected, and there was this writing on the wall. I don't know what I was thinking. And um, the punishment that they did, I can't say in front of the camera in front of you. But if they did it today, it would have been the front page of the Washington Post. <laughs> I'll tell you about it after we're done. But um, I remember I was a Sunday morning, and I saw my dyke coming up dressed like Abraham Lincoln with a big entourage of people. And I was on my way to Sunday brunch, 
and I, I, I walked, I looked at these guys, and I had sort of forgotten that I had done all this stuff, and, and they walked, and as I'm walking by, hold your arm out, as I'm walking by, they went like this, and one guy in each arm, and they dragged me back upstairs. <laughs> and what happened, like I said, I'll tell you privately, I cannot tell in public what happened, but it would have been front page of the Washington Post. It would have been a, a sensational um, story. Yes? I speak German, uh, my family's German, and I know the culture. And um, so it was like a, it was something, and I knew I could do a good job over there. Um, I, I studied German here at VMI. This is where I fell in love with German. Um, I had some great professors, and uh, I was a history major, but I think I enjoyed German more than, more than history. Yeah, it was real, I really, really loved it. And I still do. I still speak German, and I belong to some German clubs, and... German doesn't like me though. I've I've got blood pressure issues, and I I grew up eating that food, and now now I'm borderline vegetarian because uh, you grew up eating uh, blood sausage and uh, uh, all that stuff your whole life, and it really uh, really takes a toll. I guess uh, what do we, what's next now? We go back. Uh, okay. If you guys, um, I'm going to be here for the whole conference, so I, I, I'm sure people are going to have questions. Uh, please come and find me, and I'll be happy to talk to you anywhere. Thank you.